So they concocted something. And, and if this case stands and if there's a conviction, uh, you know, we're all in danger. You know, today it's Trump. Tomorrow it's going to be Biden or some Democrat that they're going to go after. And the next day it's, it's your uncle or cousin. I am delighted to be joined by none other than Alan Dershowitz, who is a very well-known American lawyer and author of Get Trump, The Threat to Our Civil Liberties, Our Due Process and Our Constitutional Rule of Law. Uh, And it's a book of uh, extraordinary relevance, really, and particularly this week, as Donald Trump starts his first criminal trial. Uh, And... This case, the Manhattan case, Alan, people are saying that it is the weakest in many ways legally of the indictments. Um, But it may be the only one that gets done in time for the election and maybe the only way in which Donald Trump will be called a convicted felon before November 5th. Is that your reading of it? Well, it's not only the weakest case of the four, it's the weakest case I've seen in 60 years of practicing, teaching and writing about criminal law. It starts with a misdemeanor that's way beyond the statute of limitations. And then to turn it into a felony, you have to prove that in his mind, in his mind, psychoanalytically, the only purpose he had for keeping this hush money secret, not disclosing it, was to influence the election, not to protect his wife, not to protect his business interests, not to protect his children. And if that's the case, then you can argue that he did it for purposes of violating election law, which is a federal crime, but the federal government refused to prosecute it. Mm. So you have the city government going after somebody for a federal crime that the federal government didn't want to prosecute. It's the most bizarre combination of factors and um, that I've ever seen. But it may result in a conviction because the New York jury pool is going to be 85 percent people who voted against Donald Trump. And even the first six that were picked, uh, the seventh who removed herself, uh, seem to be very inclined against Trump. Their information comes from CNN and from the New York Times and from MSNBC, which have been very biased in reporting that CNN has made this to be the strongest case since the Lincoln assassination. Uh, and, 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 and you get such biased reporting. You know, there's an interesting story that your viewers might be interested in. I was the lawyer in the O.J. Simpson case, and uh, people were shocked at the verdict in that case. But people who saw it on television were actually less shocked than people who read about it through the bias of the media. The mm. same thing is true here. This case is not going to be on television. So people won't see how weak it is if they read about it in the Times or hear about it on CNN. On the other hand, if they hear about it in Fox, they will know it's a very weak case. And that's what's happened. The tragedy of the American media is that uh, we have no more Walter Cronkites who Mm. people can really trust and say, oh, my God, this person could put aside his biases. And if if media people can't put aside their biases, how do we expect jurors to put aside their biases? It's quite hard for even neutral observers, I think, to not uh, show some outrage at these indictments. I mean, I think of myself as neutral. Some people might disagree. But I read the I remember reading this indictment when it when it landed. And I thought it was I'm no lawyer. I don't understand uh, the American legal system very well. But it was obviously uh, thin. And it was very obviously um, scattergun. And, you know, the 34 felony, the 34 counts uh, were really very sort of randomly repetitious uh, it felt like a, a an attempt to pin something or just hope that something sticks, um, which is which is what yeah. it is, is it not? It is, and that's why I entitled my book Get Trump. It wasn't original with me. Get Trump was the campaign promise of both the district attorney and the attorney general of New York. Mm. You know, Canadians can't appreciate this. British people can't appreciate this because you've never heard of an elected prosecutor or an elected judge. It's an outrage to elect prosecutors and have them campaign on the promise to get somebody. Mm. Uh, That's not the way the justice system should operate. That's Stalin talking to Lavrenti Beria in the 1930s, in which Beria, the head of the KGB, says to Stalin, show me the man and I'll find you the crime. In this case, people campaigned on the promise to get Trump no matter what. And in the New York case, 
They couldn't get the feds to prosecute him. The prior district attorney of New York wouldn't go after him on the same charge. But this guy initially didn't want to go after him. And then his left wing, hard left progressive staff members put pressure on him to prosecute. So he said to them, well, find me something. Well, they couldn't find anything. So they concocted something. And, and if this case stands and if there's a conviction, uh, you know, we're all in danger. You know, today it's Trump. Tomorrow it's going to be Biden or some Democrat that they're going to go after. And the next day it's, it's your uncle or cousin. Uh, if you can make up a crime like this against a prominent person who has the resources to fight back, imagine how easy it is to make up a crime against somebody who doesn't have uh, the ability to hire a good lawyer and fight back. Um, we in Britain often talk about the politicized nature of the American justice system uh, and, you know, having legal authority figures uh, who are elected or, or brought about through politics, uh, put in power through politics. But it's not natural to the American Constitution, is it? It's not part of your constitutional. It's a it's a Andrew Jackson era thing, is it not? It's that, There's it? no question about that. Jacksonian democracy was really a double edged sword. Uh, it wasn't real democracy. Obviously, blacks didn't vote, women didn't vote, poor people didn't vote, but it extended democracy absurdly to, uh, let me give you an example. <laughs> In the state of Florida, where I live, you not only elect the prosecutor, you elect the public defender. Now, can you imagine the campaign for public defender? Candidate A says, well, I went to Dershowitz's class at Harvard. I've learned every trick in the trade. If you elect me public defender, I will free every murderer, rapist, and robber to go on the streets. That's candidate A. Candidate B, I flunked out of law school three times. I don't know anything about the law. If you elect me, I guarantee you all the bad people will be convicted. Who are you going to vote for? The idea that you vote for a public defender is Jacksonian democracy gone wild. Mm. And that's what we've done. We elect everybody in this country. Look, it's spreading to Great Britain a bit too. Judges now get appointed based on race, gender, political ideology, uh, mm. no longer is it completely a meritocracy. We're seeing the end of meritocracy all over the Western world. And we're seeing in substitute for meritocracy, identity politics. And so Britain will suffer a somewhat different fate. But I'm told by my British barrister friends that the bench has suffered enormously as the result of picking less qualified people because of their racial, ethnic, or gender identity. You know, you need diversity, but diversity should come naturally from making sure everybody is eligible and fairly, fairly judged based on their own qualifications. Well, it's funny that you should say that because the cover, uh, our listeners won't be able to say it, but the cover of The Spectator this week is uh, the usual targets, and it's on the rise of political prosecutions. And there's Trump in the middle, but then Nicola Sturgeon uh, from Scotland, Angela Rayner, who's a Labour figure who's currently getting in legal trouble over her tax affairs, and Boris Johnson, who was uh, pursued by the, the police and the legal system over Partygate and, and various uh, things that we don't have to get into. I remember a very, very distinguished uh, a high court judge uh, who, after he died, they tried to make allegations uh, against him. Uh, you know, Due process extends beyond the life of somebody, mm. and so important that we understand the presumption of innocence. Look, we learned that from from the British. The Magna Carta is still the dominant legal tool that do, that uh, occurs in America, and and we're neglecting a Magna Carta, and we're neglecting a, a seven hundred and fifty eight hundred years of precedent in order to serve the interests of diversity, equity, inclusion, intersectionality, and other kind of hard left machinations that are result oriented. And our country's uh, legal systems are in great jeopardy, ours more than yours because of elected prosecutors and judges. Mm. But every Western democracy uh, faces a challenge from uh, the absurdities of race-based justice. Remember, the Bible, interestingly enough, instructs judges do not recognize faces. That's one of the instructions to judges. It goes back 2,000 years before Magna Carta. Uh, that is wear a blindfold. Don't know the race or gender or, or identity of who you are judging. Just base it on the law and the facts. And we're ignoring that. Mm. Well, is, isn't this just a, a weakness in democracy that um, the law has to be above uh, politics um, in many ways? 
and uh, you will inevitably, if you, if the, if the, the culture, if the society doesn't have a strong sense of right and wrong, uh, the law will inevitably start to corrupt or start to be tyrannical over the political system. Yeah, and you know, in the United States, when we uh, established our constitution, there was one word that was never mentioned in the constitutional debates: democracy. Yeah. We were terrified of democracy because that's what was going on in France during the revolution. Uh, we wanted a republic, uh, the rule of law. Yes, democracy plays a very important role. But as you know, Churchill said, the worst form of government, except for all the others that have been tried over time. That's true. But democracy has to be cabined by the rule of law. Uh, mm. And that's why you have a constitution in Britain, an unwritten constitution in the United States, a written constitution that says democracy has its limits. You can't impose restrictions on free speech or freedom of religion. You can't establish religion. Uh, of course, Britain has established religion. The new king is, I think, um, been much more susceptible and receptive to de-establishing uh, the Anglican Church as the, the only religious uh, body in England. He talks about, you know, defender of the faiths. Mm. Um, I wish he would talk more about defender of the people. But in any event, it's moving in the right direction in that area. But democracy alone, um, obviously, uh, results in the French Revolution or, or the Cuban Revolution. Uh, we need democracy channeled by the rule of law. Uh, and that's interesting, particularly as Biden's made democracy the, the late motif of his of his whole campaign, hasn't he? Well, if you know you're ahead in the polls, and um, obviously if there were no electoral college, which is obviously anti-democratic, the framers of our constitution didn't have direct elections, as Britain doesn't have direct elections either. You don't vote for your prime minister uh, mm. directly. Uh, we don't vote for our president uh, uh, directly. And so, you know, there are there are channels to democracy as well. The Democrats always win the popular vote, but in the last several elections, they haven't won the electoral vote. And in the current election, it's going to be very, very close as to who wins the electoral vote. Um, well, I'd like to get onto that in a second, but I just wanted to ask you a broader question. What can be done to stop all this lawfare, whatever you want to call it? Well, the Supreme Court could play a role in this. Um, I'll give you an example. Donald Trump is being required to sit in the courtroom and not campaign. But there's a statute in New York that says you can make a motion to relieve yourself from being in the courtroom. After all, the right to be at trial is a defendant's right. It's mm. not the prosecutor's right to have you at trial. But the statute said the prosecution must consent. That is, in my view, unconstitutional. And I do think that challenges can be made. We have a case this Thursday coming up in the Supreme Court as to the uh, extent of judicial immunity for former presidents. We had a case argued the other day as to the January 6th issues. We do have a, a, a separation of powers and checks and balances, and the checks and balances were designed to be a check on the excesses of democracy. Mm. So there are things that can be done, but as a great Judge Lerner Hand once said, when democracy dies in the hearts of its people, courts can't do much to save it. So we have to also make sure that the people of our countries understand how democracy, the rule of law, all work in tandem to assure us the ultimate goal, which is liberty. Mm. Liberty is the goal. Democracy is the means for achieving it. Yes. Well, uh, I wonder about uh, Trump and trying to you know, get out of being in these trials, because it looks to me, perhaps rather cynically, as though he has recognised that it's, it's useful for him. It plays exactly into his campaign message. Uh, that, you know, the deep state's going to destroy him, wants to destroy him. And uh, he is hamming it up almost. He's enjoying it. Do you, do you think perhaps he doesn't want to be uh, uh, out on the campaign trail because this is an effective mechanism for him and he's still doing campaigning. It's just not quite the same. Yeah, no, it's it's a mixed picture. He obviously campaigns as soon as he comes into the courtroom gets out of the courtroom, and then campaigns at night. So it's not a total restriction. But mm. there are gag orders uh, where he can't complain, for example, about the judge's daughter. The judge's daughter is making money every day that her father presides over the trial because if Trump were to lose, and the polls show that if he's convicted, 
that there are independent voters who will decide to vote against him based on the fact that he's a convicted felon. So it's a mixed picture. He, ha he has done the best with it. He's very smart. He's turned a disadvantage into an advantage. But on balance, I still much prefer an election where I can vote against Trump, people can vote for Trump, and the election gets decided completely on how the people vote, not with the thumb, or in this case, the elbow, of the weaponized criminal justice system. I just don't want to see the justice system play any role in the election at all. And that's probably not going to be possible. In this case, if Trump loses, he will have a basis for complaining again. I want to see an election where whoever wins, wins cleanly and fairly, and no one can then say, wow, there, there was an unfair uh, outcome in the election. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Well, the, the convicted felon polling is interesting, and it's very interesting that a, a, a number of independents say, if he is a convicted felon, I, I just won't vote for him. But that suggests that there is still uh, a respect for the legal system, uh, corrupt as it is, um, that holds sway in America. Uh, do you not think that actually, when push comes to shove, people will see how what a nakedly partisan political hack job this is, really, and they will change um, their minds? They may, you know, by, by November, they may have changed their minds. I, I agree with you. I think that's possible. And especially if Trump is convicted, he will campaign on that. Mm. Uh, he will turn the conviction into a badge of honor and say, see, if it happened to me, it could happen to you. And he'll quote people like me, and he has quoted people like me who are not political supporters of his, but who care deeply about not misusing the legal system, particularly the criminal justice system, for partisan uh, political purposes. By the way, it goes both ways. The, uh, the Republicans were trying until yesterday to impeach the Secretary of Homeland Security, Mayorkas, but they were making up charges against him. It wasn't constitutionally grounded. He wasn't charged with treason or bribery or other high crimes and misdemeanors. So both parties are willing to weaponize our constitution, our legal system, and our motto should be changed from e pluribus unum to hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is the gold standard of politics today. No one seems to care that they're accused of applying a double standard. They actually boast of it. You know, what's good for my party is good for America. And that's just not the philosophically right approach, morally right approach, or legally right approach. It's part of the problem in America that Congress itself has become weaker and paralyzed, uh, in that you have, uh, I mean, Mike, Speaker Mike Johnson is now facing possible ouster. Um, the only story we in Britain hear about Congress are about, you know, it being blocked or uh, some sort of failure to pass a bill, nothing's getting through. And so you have an American system that is increasingly reliant on figures in exec with executive authority uh, and then the legal system. And, and the, the tripartite nature of the American Constitution just isn't working. Well, it's working in the sense that the framers of the Constitution did not want British efficiency. If you want efficiency, you have a unicameral legislature, Britain has a kind of one and a half camera legislature, a real House of Commons and an increasingly strong House of Lords through the judiciary, etc. But uh, and, and, and a prime minister, uh, the United States revolted against that. And we wanted to make it very difficult to do anything. So, you know, we have the Electoral College, we have the Senate, which gives as many votes to Wyoming as it does to California, absurdly. And then, you know, we have, uh, you need two houses passing a statute, plus the president doing it, then the Supreme Court holding it, upholding it as constitutional. It was designed to be inefficient. So in that respect, it's, it's working, but the public wants more efficiency. Uh, for example, the, the issue of giving aid to Ukraine, aid to Israel, aid to Taiwan, the vast majority of the American public wants that, but right now it's being torn apart by political and partisan considerations. We see that uh, repeatedly, and, and, and you're right. It's the inefficiency that gets the, the headlines rather than the occasional time when bipartisanship allows legislation to sail through as it, as it, as it used to uh, with much greater efficiency. Um, lastly, Alan, I'd just like to ask you, you wrote this book, Get Trump, what made you decide that you had to write it? 
as a Democrat, as a, as a, as an, an, a non, someone who voted against Donald Trump? Yeah, because all of my liberal colleagues have gone to shelter. Um, they're afraid to do anything that is perceived as supportive of Trump. I lost half of my friends in my vacation home on Martha's Vineyard when I defended Donald Trump on the floor of the Senate on constitutional grounds. I have relatives who aren't talking to me. And you need a liberal, pro-democratic person making the argument against the excesses of the legal system for it to be effective. So I thought I was the right person uh, to make the case uh, against the abuse of the legal system uh, against Trump. Uh, it's made me even more enemies. Um, you know, the Trump people are unhappy with me because I con consistently announce that I'm a Democrat. The Democrats are unhappy with me because I consistently announce that I'm opposed to what's happening to Trump. But my family, close friends are still are still with me. And I have an audience, thanks to you, uh, that, that can listen to my point of view and judge it on its merits. Well, it sounds to me like you're in exactly the right place. Thank you very much, uh, Alan Dershowitz. Always a pleasure to talk to you. My pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.